undoubtedly going to be the most fascinating of all the sessions of this investment conference. And the reason why it's going to be the most fascinating is because it is looking at something which is at the nexus of so many of the things that are of interest for us. At the nexus between finding the ton, the timber, the fiber that we need, at the nexus between carbon and biodiversity, but also at the nexus between food security and nutrition. I have, of course, mentioned talking about agroforestry. I'm your host today. My name is Patrick Worms, and I'm the Senior Science Policy Advisor for World Agroforestry, which is a research institution headquartered in Nairobi, Kenya, that studies the role of trees in agricultural landscapes around the global tropics and subtropics. I am also the president of the European Agroforestry Federation, which is a grouping of national associations in the European space, not only in the European Union, that are studying or encouraging or promoting agroforestry. This gives me a fairly unique vantage point in that I deal mostly with the science, but also interact with policymakers and with investors, and that I have some idea of how agroforestry systems function in the north of Finland, uh, as well as they do in Indonesia or in the African Sahel. I'm joined today by three people uh, who I respect immensely because they're trying to dial the needle on, uh, on this issue of agroforestry. First, there is my old friend Clément Chenot. Clément uh, is with the Moringa Partnership, and those of you who know trees will know that Moringa is one of these miracle trees that we're trying to promote from, uh, from the global tropics. But in this context, it's not a tree that we're talking about. It's a fund, the Moringa Investment Fund. And Clément is going to tell us uh, the, about the, the, the trials, the tribulations, and the successes of finding agroforestry projects to invest everywhere. Gaetan Herrings is with Bio Invest. I don't know Gaetan in the way that I know Clément, meaning I never had a beer with you, Gaetan, which is um, a yes. lack of my education that I hope we are going to be correcting soon. Um, but you're also trying to move into that space, or you are, excuse me, uh, you are active in that space. And uh, from that space, you are going to be telling us what the difficulties are of channeling funding into something which is a little bit more complex than a monoclonal plantation of something, or a little bit more complex than a pure carbon play, for example. Uh, we're then going to be hearing from Thomas Durland from uh, Utrecht uh, and IDH. Um, Thomas is uh, operating at a, um, uh, at, at a level which unifies everything that we're doing here. He's with the Sustainable Trade uh, Initiative, which is a foundation that uh, gets businesses and financiers and governments and civil societies uh, across 12 agri-commodity sectors, 25 landscape and 52 countries to collaborate to realize sustainability in global value chains. Now, how does that work? Um, how does that influence the kinds of financing decisions that Clément and Gaetan have to uh, have to make? And how does it take the science on board that we bring is what we're going to be discussing with that. But as your host, I also have the privilege of breaking the cardinal rule of this conference, which is the no slide rule. I will show you one slide. And here is my slide. What this slide shows you are all of the reasons why agroforestry, the combination of trees and crops or trees and livestock on the same plot of land is such an outstanding nature-based solution. You have things in there that have to do with adaptation, such as wildfire control or ground fog recharge. You have things that have to do with production systems, such as weed and pest control, less nutrient leaching, um, extreme weather buffering, nutrient cycling. And you have things that are important in, in settings where farmers are mostly subsistence farmers, such as higher stable incomes and more nutrition. Fundamentally, the reason why agroforestry works so well is that little word on the left, the high land equivalency ratio. What is a land equivalency ratio? It's simple. The land equivalency ratio is the number of monocrop area of crop that you need with the monocrop area of forestry that you need in order to together have the same productivity as one unit area of agroforestry. And even in the um, temperate zone where I am currently based, I am in Belgium, you would find that this land equivalency ratio is somewhere between 1.2 and 1.4, depending on the systems. In other words, you produce 20 to 40% more biomass per hectare than you do in a monocrop system or a plantation system. In tropical systems that can go much higher, in humid tropical systems, you can have two to three to 400% more productivity in so-called polycultures. And in some cases, such as the image on the 
lower left, which is an image from Niger and the African Sahel, you can literally have an infinite amount of higher productivity because without trees, you cannot grow any crops at all. The rainy season is often too short to allow your crops to mature. With those trees, not only do you get the products from the trees, but you also get the products from the crops. Finally, there is one word I'd like you to focus on in that little wheel in the middle, and that is on the left, that strange word aesthetics. And you may wonder what that is doing in an investment conference. It's quite simple, actually. When you talk to farmers about agroforestry, what convinces them to give it a try are these other words. The, the resilience, the higher productivity, the, 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 cross, the, the, the erosion control and all that. But when you go and ask them five or 10 years later, after they've become used to the agroforestry system and they manage it well, what is the most important thing that they themselves take out of it for their own personal pleasure? It is the aesthetic element that comes back surprisingly often. And it comes back whether the farmer you're talking to is a poor family in Malawi that's struggling to make $300 a year, or whether it's a rich farmer in France that's making $300 an hour. Um, you really have very, very little differences in the responses, which is encouraging because it confirms me in our belief that despite the superficial differences in incomes, race, religion, and all the rest of it, we are all fundamentally the same kinds of human beings and respond to the same kinds of incentives, which makes the works of investors uh, a lot easier. And it also signifies and suggests that once these systems become established, simply because people like them, they will tend to survive whatever modernity tries to throw at them. Now, that being said, um, since this is so absolutely wonderful, where do I get rid of uh, my share? Ah, here we go. Now, since, um, since agroforestry systems are, 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 are so wonderful, um, they attract the interest of rich individuals who want to change the world. And, and that's what happened in your case, Clément, wasn't it? It was, uh, it was one of the family, the Rothschild family members, who somehow became fascinated by agroforestry and decided to launch your fund. Why, why don't you tell a little bit about how that happened and how easy you found the going to be? Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so as you said, uh, 10 years ago, we initiated uh, a fund, a uh, private equity investor, uh, investment fund dedicated to agroforestry enterprises in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, today, we speak more about agroforestry. Patrick, I'm sure you will confirm that. 10 years ago, it was less the case. And that being said, uh, we've been able to convince some investors, uh, so public uh, development uh, institutions, but also private investors, such as the Rothschild family, other families, also invested in, in that pioneer, uh, pioneer fund. So we rose uh, 10 years ago, a little bit more than 80 million euros that today is deployed. Uh, we have invested in 10 agroforestry enterprises located in Africa and, and Latin America. And uh, we, we wanted, uh, 10 years after that, we wanted to, to, to share some lessons learned, just to say that we recently published a, a white paper, because today there are more investors into that space that want to scale up those agroforestry solutions. And as a pioneer of fund, uh, but we had to, to go through some challenges, as you say, Patrick. And uh, today we're keen to share on, on, on this experience we had, not to repeat the same mistake, also to benefit from, from what is working well, to, to scale up uh, those solutions, those agroforestry solutions. But That's very interesting, Marie. That's very, very interesting, Clément. I, I mean, obviously, you're still in business 10 years later, so it's not, you know, I'm very glad that it's not a complete failure, but um, I, I haven't read your white paper yet. I apologize. So if you, had to summarize, if you had to summarize it for a bunch of foresters, which is what most yeah. of our audience is today, what would be the three lessons, the key three lessons that you're taking out of the last 10 years? So three lessons of it. One, one word to say that, okay, we have deployed uh, 80 million in 10 agroforestry companies. Uh, today, uh, these companies have developed plantations uh, at large scale, agroforestry plantations. So it's roughly 12,000 hectares that were developed through these different companies. These companies have developed processing factories. That's one specificity of the fund is not only to produce raw food and raw timber, but to process them, to capture added value. One of our objectives is to be profitable. We want to have social and environmental impact but we are, a, we are an investment fund and we need to be profitable. And for that, it's essential to build factories, to, to climb up the value chain. 
And, uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, today, uh, some of these companies are profitable and we're very happy about that. We've got some good success stories. We've got also companies in, in difficulties uh, and, and we're keen to, to, to share those lessons learned. So three lessons learned, Patrick, you ask. The first one, let's, let's start by the positive one. Uh, the very positive one is the evolution of the market. And we're still there. Uh, I mean, uh, as you said, and one of the key reasons why, why we're still there is uh, because the evolution of, of the market is very positive. I mean, there is a gr growing demand from consumers. They want to know how the food, how the timber is produced. They want to favor products that are healthy for their health, but also that are really sustainable. So you can get premium for those products. So this is a strong evolution of the, of the market that favor this agroforestry practices on the ground. Also, there is a positive evolution on the remuneration of environmental externalities, especially carbon markets. So in 2000, there was an important carbon market 10 years ago. In 2012, the ton of CO2 fell to zero. Now this market is coming back. And this is a great news for, uh, for agroforestry systems. So that's the first lesson learned. It's a good evolution of the, of the market. Second lesson learned is more the challenge we had to face it's execution. I mean, it's a big challenge for investors like us. We had a, a lot of difficulties to deploy the capital actually because there are very few good projects and, and, and partners that are able to, to deploy millions in such, uh, in such system. We had a, a lot of challenge on, on execution to, to develop the, the plantation, to build those, those factories. And certainly it's crucial. It's crucial to success, to, 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 to select the right partner. And for us, it's a, it's a key success factor. And, if you look at, at, on what went well, what went less well regarding the different Moringa projects, it's not necessarily having the right business plan. It's really ha about having the right people. Third lesson learned is how to seize the market opportunity, the first one. Well, there is, there, there is an opportunity on carbon market. There is an opportunity to get premium on, on the food market, but there is a very strong competition also with, with very large players. And it's to be profitable, it's essential to climb up the value chain. So that's what we did uh, with the role of these companies is really not to, to only to produce raw food and timber products, but to climb up this value chain by building factories, do at least primary processing, but also secondary processing and potentially market the products to, off, to, to sell the products directly to brands and to retailers to really get the premium, to remunerate. The, the farmers on the ground. So that will be the three lessons learned from this white paper. Th th thank you. Just to remind us, um, um, where do you invest? In Europe, in China, in India, in, in Africa? Moringa? No. Yes. Where, where we invested is mostly in Western Africa. Most of our participation are, uh, are uh, concentrated in West Africa. We're in Mali. One of our biggest investment Africa is in Mali. Second biggest in the, in the Mongo value chain. Second biggest investment is in Benin. Uh, in Cashew, uh, we have another investment in, in, in uh, Togo and another one in Ghana. So that's for Africa. And in, uh, in, in Latin America, we are mostly present in, in Central America, in Nicaragua and Belize, and in Brazil. But we are focused on Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. You, you made a very good point that what you need to do and what farmers in the region or plantation owners in the region need to do is, of course, to try to get capture as much of the value chain as possible, which means that processing is a sine qua non. But how much of that is forcing you and the partners you work with to move towards simplification? You talked about cashew, you talked about mangoes, uh, you're doing, I know you're doing coffee no. in Nicaragua. Um, so you're doing big crops that already have millions of hectares devoted to them around the world. How do you move away from the no. ultimate simplification that these crops encourage you to do? No, it's not necessarily true. It's true that uh, in the end, what we, what we did uh, with Moringa, uh, we invested uh, in, in outgrowing systems. So these companies have not developed industrial plantation. You can do agroforestry in industrial plantation, but we, we have invested in companies working with thousands of farmers. And these farmers, they've got diversity of, of, of production. So, for example, in Mali, you're working with mangoes. So the farm is, it's not the company that owns 10,000 hectares of mangoes. No, it's not a plantation it's of working mangoes. with a thousand farmers who each sell a few kilos of mangoes to the factory. Exactly. And these farmers, we've got technical assistance programs to reinforce, to, to advise them to grow well mango, but also to grow well mango or cashews. It's also not to have a lot of trees, because when you've got a lot of trees, it's not necessarily the best production. 
but is to have a combination of these trees with other crops. And we're, and we, we're supporting the company that's supporting so, so the farmer to, to, to get a diversity of production. So yeah. the way your capital makes a difference is by helping your suppliers, which are small farmers, become more productive, and by develop by building these processing facilities and dealing with the ancillary financing, legal, human resource, marketing uh, uh, aspects of that. And that's how you that, that's the operation you follow. It's, it's, it's really to create a value chain. It's about creating a value chain with premium. So in the case mm -hmm. of cashew or, or, or mango, the two cases, it's it's building. Uh, 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 organic and fair trade certified uh, value chains with premiums and trying to right. get the biggest premium as possible thanks to the story associated with these companies uh, and uh, and thanks to that thanks to that premium you can uh, finance on a, on a not it's not philanthropy it's investments you can support the farmers in really have a sustainable agroforestry uh, plantation if not only I'm, going to, come, I'm, also the, the, I'm going to come to get to you, Gaetan, in a minute. But uh, one last question for you, uh, 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 Clément. Um, this is a forestry conference, or rather, well, it's forestry and agriculture. But there's a lot of forests here, and I'm sure that a lot of people are wondering where exactly is the timber in your production system. I mean, you produce mangoes. Hello. I have Hello. I have a bed I have a bed made out of mango woods, but it's coming from India, not Mali. Are you? Are you working timber as well, or are you only yeah. buying this so, one single no, commodity from your farmers? No, no, no. There are different uh, agroforestry models depending on, on the on the uh, country where, where we operate, and uh, it's true that in the case of mango and, and cashew, the, the timber element is, is less uh, important. Even so, we're talking about trees. Huh? Uh, but we've got other cases. For example, in Nicaragua, it's sage grown coffee with two value chains, uh, with a value chain on on on. Uh, on sustainable coffee, uh, and it's, uh, the products are marketed by, by Nespresso, and it's a value chain on timber. So we've got other projects where you've got uh, a clear timber component. Right. In some cases, there are trees, right. but regarding the market, depending on the case, we, we, there is a clear uh, uh, value chain on timber or not. Thank you. Um, Gaetan, is, is, is Moringa a competitor, an inspiration, and, and how do you go about your business? And, and, and what would you say are the key lessons that you've learned in, in, in the course of, uh, of making it work? Yeah, so actually we, we, we are in the process of work on, on supporting similar, same companies. Uh, so, so, so we are not competitor and actually uh, uh, be as a DFI. What we do is we are active both on the equity and on the debt side. On the equity side, we would be active only if we do co-investment with fund like Moringa and sometimes um, investee company of Moringa or any other fund might say we also want some debt funding in the mix and then we can come as a debt provider. So we can do both. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what we are witnessing, so there are two ways to arrive, I believe, to, to agroforestry. It's one, you have a pioneer uh, approach and you say from day one, I have um, uh, a business model and a, and a setup that is immediately agroforestry. And sometimes there is a lack of track record um, for, for doing that. And therefore you need to have access to more blended finance um, more strongly. Um, and, and then you have other business that do, okay, I used to do normal business, but I want to progressively incrementally move towards, um, a, a, let's say an agroforestry setting. And there it is um, in a sense more, more easy because you, you, it's more difficult to change habits, but it's more easy from a financial point of view because you have an operating company that already has, let's say, a, a stable business and, and one incrementally improves it. Uh, so I would how, say we have seen the, both yeah. How many of the latter player do you have? I mean, we, we find as scientists that it's very often hard and difficult, especially in in commercial settings, in larger commercial operations, to convince people to move to agroforestry. Yeah. Smallholders uh, often don't have a choice, right? You plant your trees or you go hungry. Uh, but big players are yeah. not under that kind of pressure. So no, how do you indeed. find that? Uh, on, on the last player, so, and that comes back to the point of, of Clément, the, the smallholder uh, 
farmer is often in the picture when uh, for a majority of the project where you can speak about agroforestry it's often um, based on, on a small of the settings for for industrial plantation uh, as we call them um, it is much more complex and there is not that often this opportunity to support the switch and if ever it happens at this stage it's often like a pilot it's not yet like the whole industrial plantation going into agroforestry at least that's my experience. experience from the project that comes to us we are never a sponsor of a project so we need basically to have people coming with the idea and then we support them and indeed at the moment it's, it's mainly the first situation rather than the second and, and, and do you monitor what's happening on the biophysical side in the projects that you finance? I mean, people come to so, you with the idea, they have a, they have a pilot, 10% of the land gets turned to agroforestry. Um, what I'm interested in is um, if you have enough of these deals already that you've been monitoring over time so that you can begin to give us some estimate of the number of players who once they try on 10% of the land go, ooh, I like this, I'm gonna do more. Um, unfortunately, there, there, are, there is at least within bio portfolio not many and not for a very long time to be able to have the, 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 the ability to say, okay, we have sufficient evidence and now we need to actually do a white paper like Clément and say, you know what, we have 30 projects that have done that and on average they gain uh, X percent margin and they, they are more sustainable, resilient and so on. So, uh, and, uh, and it's neither your case, uh, Clément, I know. So, 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 so Clément, Clément, why don't you come, for, one of the why don't you come in here? No, uh, why don't you come in here, Clément? I, 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 yeah, are, you, are, you, are your people wanting to do more and more agroforestry after you've invested in them? Uh, two things uh, to, to answer you. The first one is uh, we are sharing lessons learned and some things are, are working very well, others we've got difficulties, but we don't still have a, a final word to say on profitability. We are uh, on the last uh, phase of Moringa, we need to exit I and mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fund, so we invest and we exit from the participation and we'll see there what will be our financial performance. Uh, and uh, we are still not there yet, to have, and maybe Gaetan, that's what you want to say, okay, to have a real proof on the financial side, so, okay, it's more profitable, so then there is no more okay. debate, we are going there, so we're, we're not at that phase, okay. but what I can see is comparing 10 years ago and right now, so I'm working on a new, on a new uh, fundraising right now, uh, and I can tell you that the, it, it has completely changed, I mean, 10 years ago, it was very tough to attract investors on, on such Okay, so you're finding right money, <clears throat> but, but, but you, do you have more, more, than, more money more than money. It's more than money. It's an evolution of the market. That's what I said as a first lesson learned. You can see an evolution of the market. You can see the demand from the consumers that favor such practices. You can see the brands, the, all the players on the food and timber value chains. I mean, there is a demand that is there. And when I see such evolution of the market, I'm quite optimistic. To, to, to say that we will see this, this upscale that yeah. will come. Yeah. What I meant, uh, you, what I meant, Clement, is that uh, I think you, you might have more data point in terms of profitability of the underlying company rather than the portfolio side, which is just the resulting of the underlying company. And, and so, um, so we see positive bits and bits, but not enough to, to, to be able to say we have a, a meaningful academic conclusion, if you, if you want to say. Um, maybe the other thing that I, I actually I have those points on paper and Clément is exactly raising the same thing is, it's not just about, so it's, you need to capture uh, more premium by having like niche product and being able to have like fair trade, organic and so on, but vertical integration is key. And I know a few projects that I looked at in the portfolio of Clément that are, I, I totally relate to it and, 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 uh, and, it's, and it's very key. And, and, and then the other thing is that to be able to say, okay, actually it's not a question of being more costly to do agri agroforestry. And, and that is maybe something that 10 years ago, if you were speaking about that, 
people were, were thinking, I need to sacrifice and it will cost me to do it. It might cost you in terms of investment, but not so much in terms of cost of production of the, the thing that you are going to produce. And, and that is already a battle that is probably won. Now the question is, okay, we need to have the, 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 the company also capturing more value and with the whole setup, make it a, a success. Do you find, uh, would, do you confirm what Clément said, that uh, compared to 10 years ago, the demand by, from investors to invest in these uh, agroforestry systems because of the promise for sustainability that they bring is higher? For sure. I mean, everyone sees the pressure coming from all sides. You have the European taxonomy, you have the uh, Paris agreement, now let's say the Glasgow <laughs> agreement, uh, and, and so on. So. Um, clearly, and as a DFI, uh, I can tell you the pressure is on like significantly, uh, which means that the pressure will be on all the fund and uh, all the company. Um, and, and when you know how much capital there is behind that, it's a question of finding actually those investment opportunity rather than having the money. Um, so and that, and, is no, and, that is no different. Sorry to interrupt, but that is no different from what Clément was telling me ten years ago. There was money on the table. Clément had money from Rothschild on the table. He had his fund, and the sheer difficulty he had in finding investable projects was enormous. Now, you tell us, uh, Clément, that you've invested eighty million dollars in, in in ten uh, 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 large scale or mid sized uh, agroforestry businesses, but it was a hard slog to get there, wasn't it? Do you confirm that, Gaetan? Yes, capital loves agroforestry projects, but uh, it wants the kinds of agroforestry projects which are really hard for you to put on the table. Yeah, but more now you have also more probably blended uh, funding available to do it, and you have also more more track record on how to do it. And 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 as Clément was saying, it's not so much a question of uh, I mean the project and the business plan. We, you can find many, but you need to find the right person the right sponsor, uh, and that is 80% of the job done. Uh, and so the, the question is really that, I mean, people, 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 and, and then the rest will normally, it's, it's easier. Uh, that's my feeling, at least any, any sector, including agroforestry. So Thomas, you're with the uh, Sustainable Trade Initiative, but before joining that, you actually worked on, on oil palm. You're trying to do sustainable climate smart oil palm with smallholders, uh, which is, of course, the uh, motherhood and apple pie or the Father Christmas type of oil palm that we all want. How easy was it to uh, get industry to support that? And uh, how competitive can that kind of oil palm be uh, in a market for one of the world's big commodities? And that's the first question. And the second question is, since you're now with this, uh, uh, this foundation that is trying to um, increase the sustainability profile of a large number of agri-commodity sectors across an even larger number of countries. How do the lessons that come from this one commodity translate to all these other commodities? Um, so I, I think just talking briefly about palm oil, because I think palm oil and agroforestry is still not a topic that marries very well yet. I think there's a lots of sustainability issues that we're trying to tackle in, in oil palm. Um, and, uh, and and for many farmers, sort of the immediate reality is how can I make sure that my aging oil palm tree uh, gets replaced, uh, which is uh, aging oil palm trees is one of the main reasons why uh, a lot of the deforestation is happening in countries such as Indonesia uh, because of the, the lack of land availability and the lack of capital for small farmers to replant their uh, their aging trees. So thinking, so trying to add an, an additional agroforestry layer on top of that for many uh, smaller farmers is a, is a very difficult. Uh, step to take, right? Because uh, you're operating in an already risky sector and you're adding even riskier elements to that. Well, um, I, I will push back there because uh, I, we merged with the Center for International Forestry Research, which is based in Indonesia and has done an enormous amount of work on smallholder oil palm. And we find that most smallholders already use an agroforestry system for their oil palm production. They may not call it that and buyers may not recognize it as being agroforestry, but it is an agroforestry. They're mixed use systems, mixed production yeah. systems with a number of different value chains of which oil is only one. It, 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 presumably, that's not what you meant when you said it's difficult for producers to move into agroforestry. It's true. Yeah, and I think what I'd better try to say is that 
speaking also more in agroforestry in general, right? I think some have mentioned before the demand has definitely increased. We're also talking here about agroforestry as a natural climate solution. We know that uh, in terms of sort of uh, CO2 sequestration, even though there are some side notes to make to that on the effectiveness in, in agroforestry system, uh, talking about permanence, there's quite a number of risk involved, but the demand is definitely there and it's increasing. But at the same time, it's more sort of the, the, the actual uh, uh, projects on the ground where it can be implemented that are still lacking. Uh, and so also mm -hmm. the, the evidence also in a way that is digestible for investors that would actually allow them to uh, change their risk appetite is, is still limited, I would say. I think this is mm -hmm. one of the bottlenecks that also here at IDH, we try to support in solving. So uh, at IDH, we do many things, uh, but in the landscape finance team that I'm part of myself, what we do is we manage uh, so-called technical systems facilities for several blended finance funds. Um, so as I think Gaetan also mentioned, there's an increasing number of these blended finance funds out there um, mixing both public capital and private capital. And as a result, they're able to take uh, more risk in their investment. They're able to take uh, a, a longer time horizon. So providing patient capital. And I think especially for agroforestry systems, that's very important. We're talking about growing trees. So you need to take a longer time horizon. But even for these blended finance funds, they still find it quite difficult to actually find the projects that are at the stage that they're ready to support and that they're mm -hmm. confident to provide <clears throat> capital to. Um, and so we try to support that earlier stage in what we call our pre-investment TA support, um, looking at the number of things. And I think one important uh, sort of lessons learned is, is related to agroforestry is that a lot of these systems in the end are also highly context specific uh, and require uh, piloting in the area where you want to implement agroforestry. And that requires, in, especially in the beginning, a type of capital, which is even more grant space than the type of blended finance uh, that many of these impact funds would, would be able to provide to eventually scale it. But you first need to collect data in terms of effectiveness and also in the business model, because I think yeah. these two, uh, uh, especially for the investor yeah. side, it's important yeah, that uh, there's a clear uh, business model uh, as well. That, 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 that's absolutely crucial. You're absolutely right. But yet I, I often find that the people who need educating are not the producers, but are the investors. Because the data that we do have show, for example, that you get much higher resilience from uh, agroforestry systems and much lower input costs. If we're talking about oil palm, for example, the, a lot of the work we've done in Indonesia and in Brazil uh, suggests that your profitability is much higher, even if your production of oil per unit area is lower because you're also producing a bunch of other things on the same area of land, uh, simply because your input costs are so much lower. And that also suggests that you should be able to monetize the environmental services that come from not polluting your waterways, for example, which is uh, more difficult to do if you're running a large scale plantation. Um, and, and we find that very often the models that investors use um, are predicated on a world that does not exist anymore. In forestry, for example, everybody is using models that are predicated on block plantations of usually monospecies uh, that have rotation periods of 20 or 30 years. That's the data we have. That's what we've been doing for the last 100 years. Uh, yet today, with the speed with which climate is changing and the speed with which diseases are happening, these systems are actually becoming increasingly risky. And we noticed that in the temperate zone, especially with a large dieback of plantations in places like Scotland or Germany or Scandinavia or, or Canada or the Western US. Um, agroforestry deals with that. And you're right that there's less data. We don't have 100 years worth of data to show you that it works, but we have enough data for it to be tantalizing to what I would imagine to attract investors. You're telling me that unless we have a lot more technical assistance convincing these investors, even these blended finance funds, that these are lower risk investments than the traditional investments is still a challenge? Well, maybe I'll, I'll add just one more to it. And I'm also curious to hear from Clement how he has experienced that uh, with the Moringa Fund. But I think in addition to sort of evidence on both the effectiveness of agroforestry and the business case, which you're right, in, in many areas exist, and perhaps uh, in some instances, it's more a matter of translating that in, in a way that investors would understand it. Uh, but I think another key bottleneck that we often encounter is the um, uh, disbursements of capital. Especially if you talk about smaller farmers, uh, how will the capital reach those smaller farmers? And will the 
right type of sort of service delivery system be in place to also support farmers that are asked to do perhaps more than they are uh, traditionally used to, um, perhaps looking at additional crops that they would need to grow or the other way around, right? Looking at growing uh, timber species if they weren't used to that before, uh, which would also require uh, new types of markets uh, to access, mm -hmm. which maybe they don't have those linkages yet. Um, and so reaching or, or being able to provide capital to smaller farmers, usually there's some type uh, of aggregator needed uh, for also these blended finance funds that can only participate at certain ticket sizes. Uh, but then how would that money be able to flow down to the ground, I think is another key bottleneck uh, that we often account. And there's various sort of mechanisms that you can think of, uh, but sometimes this is also an area that requires additional technical assistance. Thank you. Um, Gaetan Clément, um, how important are technical assistance in your own investments? Um, maybe, uh, Clément, you've spoken a lot, yeah. so I'm going to give it to Gaetan first and then over to you, Clément. Uh, I see Kem Clément really uh, dying to be able to say something. So go ahead. Please, please, Gaetan, please, I will, I will uh, speak after that. No, no. Uh, uh, I was uh, thinking that, you know, when I hear Thomas, it's a bit like, what we often are facing is that when you, at least when you look for funding from the FI, you cannot be in the early phase of your project. You, you know, and so therefore it's more fun like Clément that can come in and when they have generated already the next leg of track record, we can come more easily afterwards. So, so there is an investor, a type of investor needed for each stage uh, of a company life, and so I think it's knowing the right investor to speak to at the different maturity of, of the company. But Clément, I'll, I'll let you come in as well. Yeah, no, maybe just to comment uh, what you just said, uh, Patrick and Thomas, uh, about uh, risk and really uh, one of the key arguments for agroforestry system from an investor standpoint is the reduction of the risk. Uh, because you're less uh, exposed to, uh, to climate risk, you're less exposed to volatility because you've got different uh, uh, crops. And, and it's true, and, 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 and we, we, we've seen it, I mean, investing in coffee, we've not invested in, in coffee uh, monoculture, but in shade grown coffee. And you can see that having the, the, the shade of the trees, is, uh, is, you've got more resilience against climate perturbation. That being said, there is still, uh, I mean, a perception from investors when you talk, first, when you talk about agriculture, investors, they, say, they see a lot of risk. They say agriculture, a lot of risk. When you talk about emerging countries, double layer of risk, a lot of risk. And when you say, well, I won't do conventional agriculture, I will do something different, which make a lot of sense. They can hear it, but still as it is something quite new, they will perceive it as, as, as an additional risk. So it's very challenging to convince them. That being said, with the, all the pressure, especially on climate, I can see an evolution there. And second point on technical assistance, we've got a technical assistance facility, uh, a pure grant, and it's, it, it's, it's crucial. I mean, uh, the, the, the entrepreneurs uh, are, are working in very tough environments. They are developing agroforestry system with small holders. They are building factories in, in, in very poor rural areas. They need support. The, the states where we operate do not provide such support as in France or in Europe. Entrepreneurs have got a lot of support. So it's crucial for these entrepreneurs to, to succeed, to have access to some technical assistance money. Mm -hmm. We are soon going to reach the end of this session, but I'm going to put, ask each of you to comment in one minute flat. This is supposed to be a session not on agroforestry, but on agroforestry as a climate solution, as a nature-based solution. We know that there's a lot of money flowing from carbon funds um, or looking to be far flowing from carbon funds into our kind of projects. Are you integrating carbon pricing into the projects you're supporting? First, Clément, then get on and Thomas. So with Moringa, uh, it was very limited because as I said, in 2012, when we operated in 2012, price fell to zero. The carbon market was almost dead during several years and it was an additional risk to take to develop a carbon component. So unfortunately, with Moringa companies, it was very limited, the carbon development, and it was a clear limitation with our initial business plan. So now it's a very good news that this carbon market are, are coming back because it's a clear way to reinforce the economical viability and the profitability of the system, especially in comparison with, uh, with monoculture. 
And so you're being called by people who want to invest in carbon? No, no. Not yet. No doubt about that. Get no, on. no doubt about that. No, it's, it's no. clear. It's clear. Okay, it's clear. There are a lot Get of on. investors. Uh, for, for us, it's really an additional stream of revenue, but the business case should be able to hold without it. And is that the case to date? Uh, at least for the project we invest in, yes. <laughs> Some project uh, comes to us and say, well, that's my main business is based on on carbon pricing and then i by the way have some sort of production then we step up i understand thomas i think very similar answers as uh, clement Gaetan. so in, in many cases also with the funds that we partner with uh, it can be a really key aspect of the business model it can even be a tipping point to make it uh, sort of uh, yeah clear that this is a very good investment opportunity uh, but in addition to other potential revenue streams. And I think this is still related to many of the, the risks that people see with carbon finance. I think permanence is a very mm. important one, even by creating a buffer of your credits. How do you make sure that these trees are being grown and maintained for the lifetime of the, of the project and the credits? Um, and I think another important one is, especially if you look at transitioning to an agroforestry system and for example by integrating some type of timber species it takes a while to see the returns on that investment also in carbon finance if many of the carbon investors are paying once the credit is being generated and so who is paying for the initial development right. phase is, is often a challenge yeah I, I understand on this permanence issue uh, i would say there's another issue which is even more fundamental which is that right now, uh, frankly, the carbon monitoring services that are commercially available are a little better than guesswork. Um, you might be better off uh, throwing a dartboard at the wall to estimate the carbon mitigation potential uh, than buying some of these services. And the reason is quite simple. Um, most of these services will try to estimate what's happening to soil carbon by measuring what's happening in uh, the first 20 or 30 centimeters of the soil. And in an agroforestry system, that's completely pointless because trees have deep roots. And uh, the carbon fluxes between soil horizons is what makes a difference. I can show you measurements that suggest that agroforestry is detrimental to soil carbon, but that's because these measurements are based only on the top layers of the soil, right? Not on what happens further down. If you measure it properly, of course, you have much better data. Um, it turns out that getting that kind of information is very, very, very hard unless you're willing to invest heavily in, into monitoring. Um, as it happens, World Agroforestry, for which I work, uh, has been doing this for 40 years. We've been measuring sentinel landscapes across Africa and other parts of the tropics for 40 years. We have hundreds of thousands of samples of soil uh, uh, samples uh, measured at a number of different depths. Uh, and we've used that to um, uh, educate our artificial intelligence. So when we interpret remote sensing imagery, we actually get answers that are somewhere around 90% accurate. Uh, an honest private supplier will tell you that they're in the region of 50 to 50, 40 to 50% accurate. So we have much higher, much better quality data, not because we're clever, but simply because we spent 40 years measuring this and we've measured the depth. The question that I then have is how can you, as the people who are in touch with these investors, help investors understand that on current carbon markets are contracts that are in many cases written on little better than thin air? First, uh, Thomas, then Gaetan, and Clement, I'll ask you to close and also to think about closing words because it's 1600 and we have to wrap up soon. Yeah, I think a uh, good question. Um, I, I think that indeed the, the sort of the evidence of, of the carbon uh, that's actually being, being sequestered or that's being reduced uh, of these carbon projects is still a still big issue. And I think from an investor perspective, especially sort of this balance between making sure that you collect robust data that's trustworthy and that your carbon credit is based on real carbon benefits and, and not, as you say, thin air, um, but combined with still this business case that investors look at and minimizing transaction costs. Uh, and I think that's right. where still there's a lot of a benefit to gain from, from um, yeah, sort of collating research data, uh, localized data sets, and also using technical systems to, uh, to, to, to collect actual evidence of these projects that allow investors to take better investment decisions uh, and, and so also have a real impact. It's about most it's about more science, better technical assistance. Gaetan? Uh, 
So um, I would be very happy to support uh, additional projects active in the agroforestry, and we would be happy to uh, provide uh, technical assistance next to our funding to better monitor what is the actual climate benefit from our investment. As they say in French, ce n'est pas tombé dans l'oreille d'un sourd. Thank you, Gaëtan. Clément? No, and I agree with my fellow colleagues. Uh, I, I agree with that. And, and we also started on the, the technical assistance is about uh, uh, helping the, the entrepreneurs, but also preparing the, the future of, this, of these businesses and, and definitely having more robust evidence. On, on climate, on biodiversity also, we've not talked about, we talked a lot about climate, but also biodiversity uh, is going to be an important matter. It's also something we're, we're working on. Indeed, in the finance conversations I had at the COP in Glasgow, integrity was a key word that kept on coming back. And what people meant by integrity was not just carbon, but carbon plus biodiversity. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings our conversation to a close. I'd like you to virtually, I'd like you to unmute your microphones and to applaud our three fantastic uh, uh, panelists. I hope you found it as um, interesting and as insightful as I did. There is money available for agroforestry and agroforestry, as I keep on saying, is the future of both agriculture and forestry. So all we have to do is help the world realize that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.